All right, this first module in the class, all the rest was just an introductory material and getting you interested in the topic. Uh, this is about crystal structures and electronic materials. And what we're going to talk about today is um, how atoms are arranged in solid materials, um, how to analyze and classify different types of crystal lattices, and specifically the crystal structures in semiconductors is what we're eventually going to get into. We'll start off by talking about just a few basic crystal structures, and then we'll talk about the ones that are common in semiconductors. We'll touch a little bit about on how crystals and semiconductor wafers are manufactured, just so you have a little bit of information on that. If you're interested in manufacturing technology, how semiconductors are made, um, this is probably not the class to learn about all the manufacturing techniques. And when I went to grad school, we had a whole different class, two, or th two classes, in fact, on semiconductor manufacturing technology. But uh, we'll touch on a few of the um, techniques because you know, being able to manufacture these materials is just impor as important as the uh, properties of the materials themselves. If you have a real co really cool material, but it's not manufacturable at scale, then it's never going to make a huge impact, I would say. Uh, just a note, uh, because I'm, you know, some of this stuff is published on YouTube, is that a lot of the images from that, that are going to be on these slides are from these textbooks, the Streetman and Banerjee, which is the textbook for this class, Solid State Electronic Devices. There's also a couple of books by Neiman, Semiconductor Physics and Devices, and Dmitrijev, uh, Principles of Semiconductor Devices. I try to pull material from some, some multiple textbooks because uh, one person tends to illustrate or explain a certain topic better than others. And, um, you know, I recommend that for you, too. It's one of my philosophies. If you don't understand how I'm teaching the, uh, a certain topic, look it up online and see if, if someone is doing, um, explaining it in a way that's more digestible to you. And, of course, you can let me know, too, if there's stuff you're confused about. I'm happy to try to explain it in a different way. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Um, the different types of solids. And for those of you, like I said, the material scientists here, this is all really basic stuff that you probably learned in your freshman year. <clears throat> uh, there's the different types of solids are crystalline, amorphous, and polycrystalline. Okay, and the difference between them is just that you know crystalline materials have a repeating arrangement of atoms. So, um, you know, you can see here an example of a crystalline material where there's this equal spacing between the atoms, and there's a repeating unit. If you can find a, re a unit that is just being repeated over and over again, then that's a crystalline material. All right. On the other hand, an amorphous material is a material that has no repetitive pattern to it. You can see that these atoms are just uh, randomly dispersed. And something in the middle would be a polycrystalline material. So a polycrystalline material is crystalline in some areas, okay? It's crystalline in some areas, but um, you can think of it as, as pieces of crystalline material that are stuck together. Um, it's not ex th th that wouldn't be a totally precise definition, but it would. The the more precise definition would be uh, it has regions of crystallinity that are separated by grain boundaries. Okay, and grain boundaries are actually defects or imperfections in the crystal structure. That, um, that cause a disruption in the repeating pattern. All right, so let's take a look at um, some TEM images. Uh, did we talk about what TEM is? Does anyone know what TEM is? Transmission electron microscopy. Transmission electron microscopy. This is where you take a super thin section of the sample, right? Super, super thin section, and then you put it in this device called a TEM, which takes, at a very simplistic level, it takes, a, it generates high energy electrons, and then it just shoots those electrons into the sample. And uh, the electrons have such high energy that they actually go through the sample. And then they scatter, they sort of change their directions and change their path a little bit, okay? And, um, when they scatter, they can, they can actually be detected. The way that they scatter can be detected using electron detectors. You have like this scanning, um, uh, a scanning type uh, setup. And that actually allows you to see things at resolutions that you could not see with a light microscope. 
Light microscopes only allow you to see down to the, um, a fraction of the wavelength of light. You know, typical light, like green light we were talking about earlier, that's like 500 nanometers. Okay, so a fraction of 500 nanometers, like the Rayleigh diffraction limit is like about like a half to a quarter of the, of the wavelengths of light. So you're talking like maybe 250 some nanometers or maybe 100 nanometers that you could see if you're using green light. If you use electrons, the electrons have a much shorter wavelength. They have something called the de Broglie wavelength. So they, they can see things, um, you know, you can see things on the order of the you know, angstrom scale. So electron microscopes are better for looking at really, really high resolution images. And, and TEM is basically the best that we have right now. You can actually see the individual atoms here, which is really, really cool. And when I first saw this image, I was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't even realize that, that we can see things that well. It's, it's quite amazing. This scale bar here is five nanometers. Okay, so these little dots here are individual atoms of silicon. And what you can see there is there's a repeating pattern. You go up here to the top of the material. The top of the material was amorphous. So you can see just a random scattering of, of atoms and, and that creates these diffraction or these, these patterns that, you know, basically we just interpret that as uh, amorphous. All right, so the reason we're bringing up the different types of materials is um, this, Dogma. I want you to remember this dogma, okay? That the structure of a material determines its properties. Okay, you've heard that probably you've probably heard this in every class in science <coughs> since high school. Okay, in biology, the structure of a protein determines its enzymatic activity, what it reacts with, and what it doesn't. In the chemistry world, obviously this, this, the chemical structure of atoms in, um, in a chemical molecule determines how something reacts. In the mechanical world, the atomic structure of a material determines how, how stiff it is, you know, whether you can bend it like metal, like ductile materials like metal, you can bend them and they stay in shape, or whether they fracture. You know, these all have to do with the atomic structure that determines the properties. So in this class, being an electronics class, obviously the, the structure, the atomic structure of a material is going to determine its electronic properties. Okay, so mechanical properties would be things like stiffness, plastic deformation, you know, chemistry would be things like reactivity. What are the things, what are the properties of a material that we care about in electronics? What's that? Okay, semiconducting properties. How well does it conduct electricity? That's a key property. Conductivity is a key property of, uh, of electronic material. Probably the most, you, you nailed the most important property there. How conductive is it? And it turns out conductivity depends on a lot of, a few things. The two most important is how many electrons you have, or how many electrons it holds, different charge carriers you have, and then how fast those charges can move. Those are the two key properties of a material. All right, and we'll get into other things like the band gap, which, which ultimately determine the conductivity. All right, so simple unit cells. Uh, these are things just to give you a flavor of how material science folks like look at materials or how we look at atomic structures. The crystalline materials are typically made of uh, these uh, repeating units called unit cells. Uh, for those of you who've taken the 4570, all this is gonna look quite familiar. Um, this is an example of a simple cubic. This is body-centered cubic and face-centered cubic. Uh, and these are the three most basic types of unit cells in crystalline materials. And let's just look at each one of these in turn, just so you can know what the difference is between them. Uh, is, there, is there a question? No. Um, a simple cubic material, this is where the unit cell basically has atoms on uh, all eight corners of the cube. A cube has six faces and eight corners, and there is the simple cubic uh, unit cell has one atom at each corner there. Uh, the other thing I want to draw your attention to is this A. A is called the lattice constant. Okay, um, It is the, the dimension of the unit cell, Okay, in this case just the edge of the cube, and it also happens to be the distance between two adjacent atoms. Okay, that's not always the case. Okay, A is really defined as the, the, the size of the unit cell, the lattice constant. 
All right, so this is the simplest type of unit cell. Another type of unit cell is, is the body-centered cubic. Okay, body-centered cubic is the simple cubic with an additional atom right smack dab in the middle of the cube. Okay, and this, uh, this atom forms um, some type of bonding with the atoms on the, um, on the corners of the cube. In, in some cases, it is not always, it, the, the bonding doesn't always have to be there. This is more about the arrangement of atoms in a lattice. And um, the face-centered cubic is a little bit different than the body-centered cubic. Um, if you start with the symbol cubic, and then on each of the six faces, you add an atom right in the middle of each of the six faces. So you can see this is uh, one of the face atoms, this is one of the face atoms, this is one of the face atoms here. You have six additional face atoms in addition to the eight corner atoms. All right, so which one of these do you think will have the highest density of atoms? What's that? Face yeah, the third one, the face centered cubic, right. So, um, you know, the reason why these things are important is because it turns out the density, the volumetric density of atoms and the surface density of atoms in a plane determine a lot of electronic, uh, electronic properties. Um, in the notes you'll see a link to uh, a website where you can uh, just see these nice uh, models. Let's just pick one, one at random. We'll pick the body-centered cubic one and it's a 3D model so you can just rotate it and see what it looks like. Okay, so these things are pretty, you know, pretty nice to play with. Uh, there's, there's one for this face-centered cubic as well. In fact, let's just look at that one real quick. All right, so the face-centered cubic one, you can see that on each face there's an atom in the middle. Okay. Uh, one subtle point I want to note is that if you have a, a, a repetition of if you have a repetition of this unit cell, this atom here, okay, this is this is an atom on the face. You notice how half of the atom is in one unit cell. The top half is going to be part of the adjacent unit cell. Right? So atoms are actually shared between unit cells. Okay, that's an important point when, when we start calculating volume density. All right, now let's get into uh, semiconductor materials. So elemental uh, semiconductors, they consist of column four elements in the periodic table. Binary semiconductors are combinations of column three and column five elements and column two and column six elements. And this will make sense once we start getting into, we'll go into each one of these in turn. Uh, this is just to give you a broad overview. So let's look at a part of the periodic table. And just to give you a little bit of context here, let's just pull up the periodic table here on Google. All right, wow, this is an interactive one. That's pretty neat. So, um, I don't know why this says 15. We <laughs> generally think of these as column four elements, okay? Uh, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin. Let's go back to here so you can see that uh, carbon, silicon, and then uh, germanium here. These, these are the, the three elements, the column four elements that were uh, interested in for elemental semiconductors. And then for what we call compound semiconductors, uh, the three five materials and the two six materials, uh, those are uh, also shown here. So let's start with the elemental. Um, elemental materials are things like uh, um, silicon and germanium here. It has a single element in the semiconductor, single uh, single element. All right. So uh, uh, column four elements, I'll talk about this more in the next slide, they bond with four other atoms. So if the single element can make covalent bonds and form uh, eight electrons in its outer shell, so it's happy. 
So they can form lattices just on their own, silicon on its own, germanium on its own. You can also take two column four materials, two column four elements, and put them together into a lattice, assuming that they're of not two dramatically different sizes. So let's say I took carbon and then I took silicon. Okay, remember, remember, the further you go down the periodic table, the larger the atoms become. So if you take um, if you take carbon and you take silicon, they have a difference in size for sure, um, but it's not as drastic as say if you took carbon and germanium. So you can take two materials from column four, and basically you'll have some substitutions in there where you know in, it, it, instead of silicon atoms everywhere, you'll have some carbon atoms in some places. You can also do things like you know you can take silicon and germanium. So these types of um, lattices have two uh, materials in them. Okay, but they're all column four elements. That's what these uh, elemental and then these uh, four compounds refer to. Now the compound semiconductors is where you take a combination of a column three element and a column five element. Okay, and at a very hand wavy, simply simple level, column three elements have three electrons in its outer shell. Column five have five electrons in its outer shell. They can also form like covalent bonds similar to silicon and. and end up with eight electrons in, in, the, in the bonded material. <clears throat> so uh, these are different combinations of 3,5 materials. The most popular one is probably gallium arsenide, but gallium nitride, gallium phosphide, indium phosphide. Um, these are all different examples of 3,5 materials. Now, um, one feature of some 3,5 materials is that they are direct band gap semiconductors, which means they can emit light. Um, so one of the uses of 3,5 um, materials is devices requiring emission and absorption of light, so different types of detectors. Um, silicon can also behave as a detector, but it can't emit light very well. 3,5 uh, material are also have high mobility, so they can be used in high speed devices. Uh, I forgot to mention the elemental semiconductors. I probably beat this over the head, but silicon is really good for transistors and computation. Um, and it's, we have a lot of facilities and infrastructure for making things out of silicon. So the cost of silicon, uh, making things out of silicon is, is low. Um, silicon can also be used in various types of um, uh, detectors like infrared and nuclear detectors. Uh, two six materials, also used in different types of, um, uh, they have different band gap properties. They, this is where you take a column two element and you take a column uh, six element, again, the sum of the two is equal to eight, so you can imagine that they also have eight electrons in the outer shell when they form covalent bonds. Um, and these devices are used in uh, like phosphor type applications that require the emission of light. They're used in detector applications, um, and, and one, one of them being actually uh, nuclear detectors. Uh, my, uh, my wife actually worked on some of these materials for doing uh, nuclear uh, you know, detecting a radiation. Uh, so questions about these um, different types of semiconductor materials. Okay, so that being said, now we're, we're gonna spend a lot of time on silicon in this class, you know, because there's a, there's a lot to learn about silicon and it's, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's the most mainstream element that's used for semiconductors right now. So let's go back to high school chemistry and talk about the atomic structure of silicon. Um, silicon appears, it, it's a column four element, it has four valence electrons in its outer shell. Um, the specific electron configuration, which we'll talk about more in the next chapter, is 3s2, 3p2. Um, this means it has two electrons in the S subshell, two electrons in the P subshell. We'll talk more about that in the next chapter. Uh, this is the atomic number here, so there's 14. Um, sorry, there's 14 protons in the nucleus, there's 14 electrons in, in the shell surrounding the nucleus. And the Bohr model, you know, the simplistic model of the atom uh, basically shows the protons and neutrons in the nucleus in the middle here, and then they show the electrons kind of orbiting the outside in these nice, uh, neat circular orbits. That's not actually the case. The electrons, they travel around the atom in these things called orbitals. Okay, and orbitals have to do with quantum mechanics. It actually is a probability of where the electron may be. 
we'll talk more about that in the next in the next chapter but remember the purpose of models is just to give it so you have a, me a mental thing in your head that you can picture and get an understanding from right so I won't say the Bohr model is useless is actually quite it's it's quite useful in understanding a lot of different phenomena but we'll talk more about the orbital the quantum mechanical model in the next in the next chapter now uh, from the Bohr model also if you remember from high school chemistry um, or college chemistry is that you can um, create something called a Lewis or a dot diagram. Does anyone remember this stuff? You, like raise your hand if you do. Good. All right, most of you do. And um, in the dot diagram, w w why do we have four dots around there? Just the valence electrons. Exactly. Those are the valence electrons. Those are the electrons in the outer shell. And we draw those. Uh, why do we draw those? Why don't we draw all the other ones? This is what the connection of the other atoms. Exactly. These are the uh, electrons responsible for bonding, and the, uh, that's what we care about. And uh, in chemistry, the, the, those outer shell electrons are responsible for a lot of chemical reactions, so that's why the chemists care about that. So the, the chemists came up with this. They draw the, the dot diagram, just showing the electrons on its, on its outer shell. All right, so uh, this is the atomic structure of, of silicon, and now we can talk about silicon bonding. So, uh, we'll talk about covalent bonding first. This is the Lewis diagram for silicon, and hopefully every, everyone can see that. So there's four um, electrons on the outer shell. And what happens is that if you have another silicon atom next to it, like this, these two electrons, okay, these two electrons can be shared between the two silicon atoms. All right. So what they do is they we'll, we'll get into more of this in the next chapter is that you know the silicon atoms on their own is that these four electrons are in with these um, subshells these orbitals okay and then what happens is when the silicon atoms if they're brought together and they bond it forms a different type of orbital an orbital that actually connects the two nuclei together okay we'll talk more about that in the in the next chapter but the way that we draw it right now is that these two electrons form a covalent bond. They are shared between the two atoms. Okay, and if there are additional silicon atoms nearby, all right, let's say there's an additional three silicon atoms nearby, they can also form these um, covalent bonds where the electrons are shared between neighboring atoms. <coughs> all right, now, by sharing uh, by sharing the atoms, now the, the, the way that you know, we, we like to think about it in terms of completing the outer shell, if the silicon has eight electrons in its outer shell, it's happy. Right? It forms a stable bond. So this forms two here, two here, two here, and two here. All right? eight, eight electrons in its outer shell, it's happy. So what this results in is what we call a tetrahedral bond. Um, and so this, this forms what's called like a stable atomic bonding. Uh, instead of drawing all these dots, what we often do is just draw silicon, 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 silicon all around here. And we just draw a line, and that line represents a covalent bond. Okay. Sometimes we'll, we can draw the exterior dots around here as well for the, the silicon atoms that are not bonded, just to show that there's free electrons. But in a lattice, you'll just have a bunch of nuclei and a bunch of covalent bonds. Okay, this pattern repeats itself, meaning like this silicon atom also has uh, three other silicon atoms or four silicon atoms around it. Every silicon atom is bonded to four other silicon atoms. Okay, so um, in three dimensions, this is what it looks like. Uh, the reason for this is something called steric hindrance. Do you remember this from chemistry? <laughs> steric hindrance. Okay, um, like charges repel, right? So if you can imagine that each one of these uh, covalent bonds, imagine that as, just imagine it like an area where these two electrons are, are likely to be in, okay? So each one of these sticks represents a region where electrons can be. Now if electrons repel each other, those sticks are going to be, want to be as far apart in three-dimensional space as possible, right? Because those electrons are repelling each other. So it turns out in, in three dimensions, the, the configuration where these 
where these covalent bonds can be furthest apart from each other is in this tetrahedral configuration. Okay, there is a 109.5 degree angle between the bonds, between the covalent bonds. The way that I've drawn it here is not accurate because it's just a two-dimensional drawing just for concept. In three dimensions, it actually looks like this. Okay, 109.5 degree bond angle between the atoms. All right, and there are three-dimensional models online if you want to like, you know, look at a silicon lattice and twist it around, you're more than welcome to uh, do that. Um, as I said, uh, this is a simplistic model. In, in the next chapter, we'll get into the specific, what the orbitals look like, and then some of this stuff, if it seems a little hand wavy right now, will make more sense later. So um, now we can talk about the diamond lattice. All right, so before we here, we were talking about, um, we were talking about the different types of unit cells, the simple cubic, the body-centered cubic, and the face-centered cubic. Silicon is none of those. Silicon is what we call the diamond lattice. And this is what a, uh, a diamond lattice looks like. You can see that there's a lot of atoms here. And uh, um, the way that we can describe it, the way that I like to think about it, is that it's an FCC lattice with four additional interior atoms. So what that means is, remember an FCC lattice is a cube that has eight corner atoms and six face atoms. So we look at this cube and we say, okay, there's eight, there's an atom at each corner, at, at each of the eight corners of the cube. So that's eight atoms right there. In addition to that, we have six faces. So there's a face here, 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 and a face here. Six faces of the cube each have an atom at the center of it. In addition to that, there are four interior atoms. All right, and the way to think about the interior atoms is this, okay? If you were to take this large cube, which represents the unit cell of a diamond lattice, and you break it up, you cut it in half into the top half and the bottom half. So the upper half of the cube, if, if you look at it like this, if you break up the upper half into four subcubes like this, Okay, so this is just the top half of the cube. Essentially what we've done is we've broken it up into the upper half and lower half, and in each of the halves, there's we break it up into four subcubes. All right, notice that there's an interior atom in this subcube, an interior atom in this subcube. This is the top half of the lattice, and on the bottom half of, of the, sorry, the top half of the unit cell. In the bottom half of the unit cell, there's also two interior atoms, and they are just, on the opposite sides as the top half. So the top half you see is bottom left and upper right, and in the bottom half of the cube it's upper left and lower right. So those four interior atoms are spaced, uh, spaced this way. So the four interior atoms are shown in red here, just so you can differentiate them and uh, differentiate them from the other ones. So the way to think about a diamond lattice is that it's a face-centered cubic lattice with four additional interior atoms that are centered in the middle of uh, four of the eight subcubes. The other way to think about it is as two FCC lattices displaced by a quarter of the, um, of the lattice constant. I think this de second definition is a little bit more confusing, so I prefer the first one. And, uh, you, of course, you can go here and see a three-dimensional model of silicon like this. This is a single unit cell of the, uh, of the silicon lattice. All right. Uh, notice you have the corner atoms, the face atoms, and then the four interior atoms. Um, also notice from here is that each silicon atom is connected to four other atoms around it in that tetrahedral bond that we looked at earlier. Um, any questions about the diamond lattice? So silicon has four electrons. It forms tetrahedral bonding. Tetrahedral bonding, when you, when you create a, a three-dimensional material out of it, it looks like a diamond lattice. The diamond lattice is the smallest repeating unit in, um, in a three-dimensional silicon material. Um, this is just terminology, a zinc blend lattice, it's 
the, uh, the arrangement of atoms in a zinc blend lattice is identical to um, a diamond lattice. But the difference is, is there are alternating, they have alternating atoms. So silicon forms a diamond lattice and a compound semiconductor materials like gallium arsenide forms a zinc blend lattice. So let's take a look at this. Uh oh. Okay. This is gallium arsenide. So a zinc blend lattice, again, it's the same, it's identical to a diamond lattice in terms of atomic range arrangement. The only difference is that you have alternating atoms, okay? So every one of these red atoms has four yellow atoms around it, and every yellow atom has four red atoms around it. They're alternating. Because materials like gallium arsenide, you have equal parts gallium, equal parts arsenide. There's a column three element, column five element. They also form tetrahedral bonding. So and would they form the a zinc cell bonds. immediately next to it have yellow and red flip-flops? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's in a subtle but important point. All right. So um, calculating volume density. Um, I, I think that you'll just be given this as as a homework problem. You can figure this out. Um, you can figure this out on your own. Um, what material scientists uh, often do is they they look at the, the density of atoms in a lattice. Um, so the density, the units for density would be the number of atoms per centimeter cubed. The number of atoms in a given volume. The more atomic density you have, it changes the properties of the material. Now, when you are calculating volume density in your in the homeworks, which I'm going to distribute sometime this week, uh, the solutions will be there too, so you can you know you can figure it out. Um, but w when you try it, as I mentioned, do try struggle with the problems on your own, and only as a last resort use solutions. So the hint I I, I want to give you because it always trips up students is that uh, the thing that it seems to trip up students most frequently on this type of thing is that remember is that the corner atoms are are shared between um, eight additional atoms. So right, only only one eighth of the corner atom is actually in the unit cell. For the face atoms, only one half of the face atom is in the unit cell. How about the interior atoms? What is all the way so, there, so there's eight atoms all the way there. Correct. But but you guys can do this as a as a problem on your on your own. The interior atoms are not shared, so they count as a full atom. But the corner and face ones, they only count as a fraction of it because they're shared between adjacent unit cells. So you're going to calculate the the volume density of silicon atoms um, using this diamond lattice model. You'll also be asked to calculate the surface density. The surface density of atoms would be the atoms along a specific plane. So let's get into that. Um, First of all, let's talk about Miller indices. So Miller indices are used to identify crystal planes. Why do we care about crystal planes? Well, um, you know, if we were to look at, you know, there's several different crystal planes an atom might have. Um, if we look at this plane, there's a certain distribution of atoms on this plane. But if we were to cut across like this, like where my mouse is, you can see that if we cut diagonally through the atom, then there's going to be a different distribution of atoms. That atomic structure will look very different on if you cut the, ato the material in a different way. Different atomic distributions means different properties. So semiconductor materials can, like mechanical electrical properties, can actually vary along different crystal planes. And um, you may remember this term isotropic versus anisotropic. So isotropic Materials are materials that have the same properties regardless of which direction you chop the material. All right? Amorphous materials often have isotropic type properties. Crystalline materials often have anisotropic properties. They might have different properties in one direction versus another direction. One example is, is chemical etching. You know, like if you have 100 silicon, 
you know, 100 silicon is where this, um, uh, this plane is exposed, the 100 plane. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, it turns out that silicon etches very differently in if, if the 100 plane is exposed versus if the 111 plane is exposed. Right. So I said 100 plane, 111 plane. What is that? That's, we're going to get into that now. Miller indices. So in a cubic system, the Miller indices of a plane describes a vector which is uh, perpendicular to the plane. So let's say, um, you know, and this is, not, this is just math here. So if you imagine that you have an XYZ axis like this, and you draw this plane, this triangular thing that you see here, all right? The mathematical way to describe a plane, well, there's two ways to do it. One way is, is to give a vector, a vector that's perpendicular to the plane, right? Does anyone know what the other way is? How, how, what's the other mathematical way to define a plane? Sure, you could give three points on the plane, right? You need at least three points to define a plane. You know, and kind of related to that is you can give an, you can give a mathematical equation for a plane, right? Like a, a line can be described by mx, y equals mx plus b. A plane can be described by an equation that involves x, y, and z. Right? But we're not going to do those last two methods. The, the way that we describe the planes here in this class is we use Miller indices. We give the vector that is perpendicular to the plane. And that's a really adequate, that's an adequate description for a plane. So in this case here, you can see this red line here is a vector that is that is 90 degrees orthogonal to this plane. That vector is 2, 1, 4. So the x, um, the x displacement is 2, the y displacement is 1, and the z displacement is 4. All right, so the way that you did that is by you took, you know, you moved 2 in the x direction, you move, moved 1 in the y direction, and then you moved up in the z, and then you draw an arrow between the origin and that final point, and that gives you the vector, the direction of the vector. So this vector is 2, 1, 4, so we call this the 2, 1, 4 plane as well. The plane that, it, that it's orthogonal to is called the 2, 1, 4 plane. So the vector 2, 1, 4 is the Miller index for the plane. All right, and the steps for calculating the Miller indices is as follows. Um, this is a simple example. So if you want to find the intercepts of the plane, here, uh, the first step is um, to find um, the intercept. So at what point does it intersect the x and y and z axes? So in this case, uh, you can see from the graph here is that it intersects the x axis at x equals 2. It intersects the y axis at y equals 4 and it inter intersects the z-axis at z equals 1. All right, so this is an easy one because there's an intercept at, in, all, uh, in all three of the axes. If you have a plane that runs parallel to an axis, so let's say this plane was straight up, it was vertical, so it never intersects the z-axis. In that case, in that situation, um, you would enter an infinity in, um, in the x, y, and z intercepts. Infinity means it does not intercept the axis. All right, but in this case, in our simple case, we have our three intercepts, x, y, z, two, four, and one. Step two is you take the reciprocal of these numbers. So you take the reciprocal of two, you get one half. Similarly, you get one fourth. Reciprocal of one is one. If you happen to have a situation where um, one of these uh, intercepts was infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. So then this reciprocal becomes 0. And now the third step is that with Miller indices, we don't like to have fractions. So we have to multiply all multiply this vector by a, um, by a, some number that will result in an integer. So you find you multiply it by the smallest constant to get whole numbers in all three of the indices. So in this case, we multiply by four. So here you get multiply one half by four, you get two. Multiply one fourth by four, you get one. Multiply one by four, you get four. All right. So why are these two vectors equivalent? Why is the direction equivalent? Um, 
we, we just took this vector and we multiplied it by a number. And we're saying that this is this is equivalent. Why is it equivalent? Because we all care so about much the magnitude. We don't care about the magnitude. That's correct. We only care about the direction. The direction of the vector is what's defining the plane. If we multiply a vector by some number, we increase the magnitude of the vector, but we don't we don't change the direction of the vector, right? So that's why we're, uh, we're we can multiply by a constant and still, you know, have an equivalent vector. And this is just just done to keep things neat, you know, like uh, avoid having fractions in here. All right. So uh, these are examples that you can do on your own. What are the Miller indices of the planes above? I'll leave that as as a an exercise that you can do at home. The families of planes in a cubic lattice. So um, this, now we get into the issue of symmetry. All right. So um, let's go back to this side. Just by looking at this image here, it's very easy to see that if we cut the silicon wafer along this plane, if we, if we sliced it here versus if we sliced it horizontally like this, the atomic distribution would be the same. There's symmetry. There's crystal symmetry there, right? If we cut it here too, it would be the same. These planes, this plane on the top, the left, the right here, all sides of this plane, they're, they're all, they all have identical atomic structures, right? So this is, you know, this is the one zero zero plane, right? Did I get that right? Um, no, this is the zero one zero plane. This is the zero zero one plane, and this is the one zero zero plane. Okay, they all have different Miller indices. They have different Miller indices, but they're all like symmetric. They're identical, right? So that's why we say like, okay, well. The, some planes will have different Miller indices, but they're symmetric. So what we're going to do is we're going to create families of planes that are symmetric with one another. And that's what this slide is about. The families of planes denoted by curly brace, not a straight brace, a curly brace, uh, includes all the planes that have the same atomic distributions on their surfaces. So let's take the simplest example here. Um, I showed you on the previous slide that the 0, 0, 1 plane, which is this bottom plane, would be similar to the uh, 1, 0, 0 plane, and that would be similar to the 0, 1, 0 plane. Anything on the side of the cube, any, any one of the sides of the cube, well, they all have similar atomic structure. So in this example, the, the 1, 0, 0 family, that's one of the three common families of planes. The 1, 0, 0 family includes any Miller index, any plane with the Miller index that has a 1 or a negative 1 in it, and the remainder remaining indices are 0. So you see in all, in all these cases, this is 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0. There's always two zeros, and then the third one is, is an, a 1 or a negative 1. So all of those planes are symmetric. They're all part of the 1, 0, 0 family of planes. The next family of planes is where there's a single 0, and then two, uh, two of the indices are either one or negative one. And you could figure out all the different combinations of that. The intuitive way to think about a one, one, zero plane is, is if you took a plane, you cut across the cube. You can see this green, uh, this green plane here. We bisected, we cut the cube diagonally. We cut the unit cell diagonally. That is an example of a, a one, one, zero plane. And you can think of all the other iterations of that. If you take the unit cell and you think about all the possible ways that you could cut across it diagonally, where you start on one edge and you go diagonally to the other edge, those are all the 110 family of planes. And they are also symmetric. You will have a homework problem where you will calculate the distribution of atoms in the 110 family of planes and in the 100 family of planes. The final family of planes is the 111 family of planes. All right, this is denoted with the curly brace here, uh, 111. All the combinations of ones and negative ones that you could have 
in um, you know for Miller indices. Now the way to picture the 111 family of planes is a little bit trickier. What you have to do is take this is the way that I like to remember in my head. Take three adjacent faces. All right, so let's say we took the one on the back, the one on the left, and the one on the bottom here. Draw a diagonal line across three adjacent faces, and then connect them together. So this forms, you know, this red triangle uh, in here. Notice that okay, you have one, you have a line that's going diagonally across a face here diagonally across a face here and then diagonally across a face in the back. So um, those when those are connected together you get uh, one of the 111 family of planes. All right and this has a completely different atomic distribution on its uh, on its surface. All right this is the most tricky one and what I challenge you to do um, I do this with the the undergraduate class too is think of how many possible 111 planes you could have. Actually try drawing them out and see if you can figure out how many unique 111 planes you could have. Well, they're all symmetric, but you know, see how many you can draw. All right. So um, if I just jump ahead here real quick, is that the different types of silicon wafers that are available that you can buy in the store or buy uh, online or whatever, they have different um, crystal faces that are exposed. If you buy, for example, a 100 silicon wafer, that means that the silicon wafer was sliced along a 100 plane. If you buy a 111 wafer, that means it was sliced along this red plane. It was sliced kind of like diagonally like that. And a 111 silicon wafer will have very different properties than a 100 wafer does. The 100 wafer is by far the most common, just so you all know. All right. So this talks about, uh, this slide is kind of a high level summary of where, um, you know, like where our uh, silicon microprocessors come from. This is called from uh, sand, uh, from sand to microchips basically highlighting the idea that you start off with sand, which is, has silica in it. All right, it's a very common, fortunately silicon happens to be a very common element that's available on Earth. The silicon is made into an ingot of pure silicon. So this is, you know, this silicon that's out on Earth, it has oxides in it, it's, it's not pure. So you take you, you, you create elemental silicon. So this is a big metal, it looks like a metal, but it's basically pure silicon, okay? Um, then you take this thing called an ingot and you chop it up into really, really thin slices, like basically uh, 500 microns thick, which is about a half a millimeter. And you create these things like wafers. And these are the shiny disks that you often see and so this is a, basically a slice of single crystal silicon. And on that silicon, we build all our transistors through all these different processes that we'll learn about later in the semester. All right, this process is extremely, extremely important to our, you know, our electronics industry. The, because we have these manufacturing processes, that's the reason we're able to get a billion transistors on a, on a, a silicon microprocessor today. Um, you, you take a wafer like this, just to give you an idea, like um, a wafer before it's made might be worth like, you know, $25 to $100. Nowadays, by the time a wafer, it goes through, you know, several hundred steps to go from a blank silicon wafer to a, trans, uh, to a completed wafer that has, a, you know, a billion transistors for, for every, you know, like few square millimeters. The value of a completed silicon wafer is in the millions. Because what they do is they take, you know, they take this wafer and they chop it up horizontally. They cut it horizontally, kind of like you're slicing up dessert, the pieces of a pie. And each one of those little squares becomes one microprocessor. And remember, each microprocessor typically has over a billion transistors on it. 
right? So if you imagine how many transistors there are in this entire wafer, I, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I think it's like they typically have maybe, you know, thousands to uh, uh, thousands of processors per wafer. Um, let's end with this today. Let's just watch this video real quick or a portion of it. This is this video is a bit on the old side now, but it's it's still useful to see. It's a two minute video. So let's go back here. They started with sand. All right, and um, they have a process for melting the sand and to create a, a basically a melt of pure silicon. Now it's going into a big vat. All right, now they did this very quickly. I'll, this is gonna be on the next slide. We'll probably cover this on Monday. But um, they can make this thing called an ingot. All right, this is pure silicon. And then they chop this. Not with the chainsaw, they have more sophisticated techniques, but they're just trying to show you something here. All right, now if you did this with a chainsaw, it wouldn't look like this, but each of these wafers, very importantly, each of these wafers is sliced to very, very well controlled dimensions, and the surface is polished so that it's atomically flat. Very important, they, they polish it in a way that there's, it's literally just like, you know, there's no variation in the, in the atomic layers there. All right, um, continuing now. They use a process called photolithography. Um, and when you do photolithography, you can pattern certain areas of the wafer. And at a high level, you're basically saying, I want the source to go here, the drain to go here, I want the gate material here. They go through hundreds of steps of this photolithography process where they define the sources and the drains of the transistors. They define all the metal interconnects that connect the transistors together into logic circuits. This is what they're showing. Like, There's typically like seven to 10 different layers of metal that are connecting the transistors together. And then they chop this wafer up using a dicing saw horizontally and vertically. And each one of those little things becomes like each one of those blocks. You can see that thing like it, there's a vacuum tool that's used to pick up one single uh, chip that eventually becomes a microprocessor. And that microprocessor is packaged into a a, um, a heat sink that pr that helps draw away heat because I mentioned that transistor that today's microprocessors run very hot, so they put it in a, a special package that helps dissipate heat and also allows you to plug that uh, plug that thing into a motherboard. If you've ever seen the inside of a computer, it has all the interconnects where you can push that thing into a motherboard. So there's a huge number of steps that goes into making um, making the microprocessors that you can go out to Best Buy and, and basically purchase. Why is this? Uh, okay, so let's stop that there. All right, so um, uh, thanks everyone for your attention. And um, as I mentioned, look for the link. We will have class at the normal time on Wednesday. Okay, in fact, we might start even like five or 10 minutes early just to make sure that every, everyone can get on the conference thing properly. And uh, we'll just have class as we do. And um, see you know, see if you enjoy it. If you really enjoy it, we might, you know, I'm, there's gonna be other times where I'm away uh, this semester for either conferences or meetings, maybe about once a month. And there's one conference I'm in at the end of October, which I'll actually be away for two days. So if this works out well for you, I'd like to continue doing it in the semester so we don't have to skip class. There's a lot of material to cover in this class and I'd rather not skip lectures. Sound good? Because we could have, like, for some reason, like, a technical or like, internet problem. We could have, like, if, if you're not able to, uh, let me know. Let me know, first of all, and I will also plan to record it so that all you can right. watch it later. Okay. Yeah. But it would be best if you're, on, if you're all on there because I want to do this as an experiment. You know, like, I want to see if, like, if you all have questions, you can ask questions on there and um, let's just see how this works. Okay. Sound good? All right. Thank you.